So in the last episode we talked about cassette drives. If you haven't seen that yet, I suggest you go watch it first since it sets the stage for floppy drives. Oh, I love talking about floppy disks, right? So here's the thing. I don't care if they're 8 inch, 5 and a quarter inch, 3 and a half inch, or any of the 3 inch Amstrad ones, or any of the weird things in between from all over the world. I love collecting them. I love feeling them. I love looking at them. Floppy disks are more interesting than pretty much any other older storage medium to me. Technically, floppy drives had been in use since 1971 in the business market, usually in the form of these large 8 inch disks. These things were huge and you can see where they got the name floppy disk from. These are probably most well known from the movie War Games, which came out in 1983. But interestingly enough, nobody was using 8 inch disks in 1983. However, that doesn't necessarily mean the movie was wrong, it could just be that he was given a 5 year old computer by his parents, which is not unreasonable I suppose. In fact, the computer I use every day is 5 years old, so there's nothing wrong with that. Also, according to Futurama, we'll be using these in the future for video recording. Let's just see what you were up to last night while I was asleep. But the five and a quarter inch floppy disk is what most people will recognize from home computers of the 1980s. Much smaller than the eight inch, but still works pretty much exactly the same. So when I think about floppy disks, what I really think about are the five and a quarter inch floppies. Uh, when I had the three and a half inch floppies, I already had a hard disk, and so floppies sort of played a different role in my computing habits. But when, uh, when I was using the five and a quarter inch jobs, that was really the only storage media that I had. So let's have a look at how these work. First of all, on the outside you have these relief notches. The purpose of this is to minimize any bending of the disc right around the read area. This is the index hole, which was monitored by a sensor so that the drive would know exactly where the disc was rotation wise, but not all disc drives made use of this hole. This is the write protect notch. A sensor monitored this notch and if it was found to be open, then the drive knew it was okay to write to it. And if you wanted to protect your data, you could put a sticker or a piece of tape over the notch so the drive would not allow anything to be written or altered on the disk. And since it was not a good idea to leave this area exposed, a paper sleeve was used for each disk to keep them protected. Let's take a look inside and see how things work. The magnetic material is very similar to the material inside of a cassette tape or a VHS video cassette. It just happens to be round and a bit stiffer. So this part of the disk was used for actual data storage. Now you'll never be able to actually see the data on the disk, but if you could, here's how it would look. Keep in mind that the typical disk had 40 tracks, starting at the outer edge for track 1 and all the way to the inner edge for track 40. Inside of the disk drive, a stepper motor is used to move the read head back and forth to access these different tracks. Now, some drives had sensors to help it figure out where the read head was, but some drives did not. So if you ever noticed when you turn on an Apple II computer, the disk drives always make this knocking sound. So what's actually happening here is when this drive is first powered on, since it has no sensor, it has absolutely no idea where the head is. So the way they get around that is they just send the command to back the head back to track one, and they send that command 40 times. So it's guaranteed to be back at track one. Once the read head gets to track one, it can't go any further, so every subsequent attempt makes a knocking sound. It does work, however, and it does make sure that the head always starts out on track one. Commodore drives are known to make the same sound when encountering a read error or when formatting a disk. Now let's take a little bit closer look at how the data is actually stored on the disk. In order to help figure out where files are stored on the disk, the computer will divide it up into sectors. These sectors are defined entirely by software and thus can be very different from one computer to the next. This is an 8 sector format typical of the IBM PC. So if you asked for track 16 sector 1, you would be reading from this area here. And if you could see the actual bits of data, they would look kind of like this. Each dot representing a 1 and the blank area representing a 0. Now, one thing you might notice is that a sector on track 40 is much smaller than a sector on track 1, and yet they store the same amount of data in this format. However, other manufacturers handled this differently. Commodore, for example, used 21 sectors on the outer tracks, then 19 sectors, then 18, and 17 for the innermost tracks. As you can see, this made the sector similar in size and made more efficient use of the disk space. Also, Commodore had some other oddities such as using track 18 exclusively for the directory. 
Also, Commodore Disk Formats did not use the last five tracks on the disk due to some quality problems with early drives. However, it was possible to use all of the tracks with a custom format. Perhaps now it's a little bit more obvious why computers during the 1980s of different manufacturers could not read each other's formats despite using the same physical media. So an Apple, for example, could not read a disk formatted in a Commodore. Some systems, such as IBM, typically used double-sided disks. Now what that means is they used two read heads, one on top and one on bottom, so they could store twice as much data on a single disk. Well, sort of. You see, on Commodore and Apple drives, you could turn the disk upside down to use the back side of the disk. There's only one problem. See how the right protect notch lines up over here? Well, when you flip the disk around, the drive will now think that the disk is right protected and it won't let you write anything here. The solution is to make another hole. Now, they actually sold products specifically designed to do this, but I would usually just take another disc and a razor knife and cut a slot out. Now you had a right protect notch for both sides so you could use the full capacity of the disc. So let's talk about the actual drive mechanisms themselves. Now, um, this is a typical full height drive that uh, would have been used by an IBM PC or an Apple or even a Commodore back when they were making the PET. A few years later, most everyone had switched to half-height mechanisms. Now, check this out. See how much larger a Commodore disk drive is compared to an Apple disk drive? Why is that? So, Commodore and Atari took a very different approach to their disk drive controllers. Uh, let's take a peek inside this Commodore 1541. Look at that huge circuit board. Now, wait, what is that? A 6502 CPU? The same one used in the computers themselves. And here we have two I.O. controllers, exactly the same one used in the computers, and 8 kilobytes of ROM and 2 kilobytes of RAM. So it's very much its own self-contained computer. Let me demonstrate this. This is a neat little program that makes your disk drive play music. It accomplishes this by using the stepper motor for the head and vibrating it back and forth. But the more interesting part is that you can now unplug the drive from the computer and it will continue to do its thing all by itself because the program is executing internally. Now, why did Commodore put a whole computer inside of their disk drives? Well, my guess is that they probably did it to reduce cost because it was no longer necessary to put a drive controller inside the computer and many of the computer users were actually happy not even owning a disk drive and just using a tape drive instead. Basically, with an Atari or Commodore, the computer doesn't even really know where the information is coming from. It just sends a request out the serial port and says, I'm looking for file XYZ. And the drive will check the disk and see if it can find it. If it does, it sends the file back to the computer. An Apple does something very different. It has to send very specific commands to the disk drive telling it to move the head, spin the disk, and all of the decoding of the tracks and sectors are handled by the computer's CPU. Now, you might think that Commodore drives should have been much faster than, say, Apple or IBM drives because, I mean, they had their own processor on board. Well, it didn't really work out that way, and in order to understand why, you have to go all the way back to the Commodore PET. The PET disk drives were huge, but they were decently fast because they used the IEEE 488 parallel interface. It was a 24-pin connector and had 8 pins for parallel data transmission. Well, when Commodore came out with the VIC-20 a few years later, they decided to move to a serial interface where data was transmitted one bit at a time. That wasn't necessarily a problem since they were going to use a hardware shift register which would take care of this at the hardware level. However, the hardware was faulty and it was too close to the time of release so they just did away with the shift register and instead just programmed the CPU to uh, address the data line directly and it was pretty darn slow and they didn't even use the most efficient uh, routine possible. But that's the kind of thing that happens when you push design changes into a product at the last minute before it launches. Since the VIC-20 only had 5K of RAM, it really didn't matter that much but the C64 came out soon after and had a lot more RAM, but they wanted to maintain backwards compatibility with the disk drives for the VIC-20, so it ended up being very slow. I remember the first impressions of plugging it in and loading up a couple of disk games, I was very, very underwhelmed by the actual speed of this thing. I mean, this thing was as slow, and in some cases even slower than the C2N data set. And how could this be? I had no idea that a disk drive would actually be slower than a turbo load on tape. Now interestingly enough, people eventually figured out how to make some more efficient and thus faster software routines for communicating with the disk drive. 
So cartridges such as this Epix Fast Load came to market. All this cartridge does is replace some of the kernel's disk drive routines. This is the Epix Fast Load cartridge. And this is something that I would recommend to anyone that wants to use a disk drive on a Commodore 64 with the original disks. This thing will actually speed up loading times four or five times and this is very compatible. In fact, it's worked with every single disk I've ever thrown at my 1541. Commodore later sort of remedied this with the Commodore 128 and 1571 disk drive. The combination of these two have very fast disk access, but the problem is it's only fast when operating in native Commodore 128 mode. But since most games were required to run in C64 emulation mode, the drive was just as slow, thus requiring a fast load cartridge. Now eventually we moved forward to the 3.5 inch floppy drives. And sometimes they were mistakenly called hard disks by people that really didn't know anything about computers. Some of the first computers to use these were the Amiga, the Macintosh, and the Atari ST. Now these guys were with us from the late 80s all the way into the 2000s and apparently will even be used in the future to store robots' hey, brains. I downloaded his brain. Everything that is Bender is right here. His mind, his memory. It's basically the same technology, just in a smaller, more durable casing uh, with a right protect tab that can be moved on or off so you don't have to use a piece of tape. So many of you may have heard that the US military still uses old floppy disks in some of their specialized computers, like for controlling nuclear missiles and things like that. Well, is that a problem? Not necessarily. You see, those drives and disks were actually extremely reliable back in the 70s and 80s. Of course, they also used to be expensive. A box of 10 floppy disks could actually set you back. In the 90s, they started making them cheaper and cheaper and the reliability suffered. And by the 2000s, when the last batches were being produced, they were total junk. The last few boxes of disks that I bought, probably around 2005, probably some of the last ones you'd find in a computer store, uh, they were actually Sony brand, a brand that you might think would be of high quality, and uh, they were total junk. Uh, in fact, three or four disks out of each box of 10 didn't work right. One of the other things I think that people don't realize now is just how much floppy disks actually cost back then. You know, you can go now to the store and you can buy like a, a spindle of like 50 CDs or DVDs for like $10, which I know are all, they're also on their way out. But, you know, back in like when I was a kid and I was using computers in like the late 80s and early 90s, you could easily drop $20 on like a 10 pack of, of floppy disks. And really by that time, the price had already come down. You know, before that they were, they were even higher. And it was expensive enough that I actually had to ask for a box of disks for Christmas. I think because floppy drives and the disks had become so unreliable towards the end of the era, um, I think a lot of people remember them that way, even though they were actually pretty darn reliable back in, in their heyday. In fact, I have plenty of disks that are like over 35 years old and they still work just fine. I've got some floppy disks that have survived since the like 1979 from Heathkit Systems and they're still fine. On the other hand, I've got floppies from 1999 and they didn't last until like 2003 and they were done. Toast, I lost a bunch of cool stuff, but that's how it goes. That's kind of a thing that's unfair to floppy disks. I think if you take care of them really well, at least from the ones that I've got in my collection, they tend to last for a really long time. As a retro computer collector in 2016, let me just tell you that dealing with these aging floppy disks is a huge pain in the butt. However, there are solutions like floppy drive emulators now that make working with these machines a lot easier. But uh, I have to say there is something comforting and nostalgic about hearing that sound. And if you want to really appreciate floppies, just compare them to tape drives, or even worse, to these old punch tape reels that were incredibly noisy. Of course, floppy disks were eventually replaced by optical media such as CD-ROM, which is a tale for another episode some other time. But one thing I can say for sure is that the track sector concept that we talked about earlier lives on today in magnetic hard drives, only the data is so much more densely packed. Now I suspect in another 5 to 10 years, um, everything's going to be solid state and I think moving disks like hard disks and stuff like that are going to be obsolete forever.